we are feeling very, very good. As my kids told me this morning, I too am pulling equally with the leaders, so feel good about that. And I think most importantly, we're really excited to have the folks gathered in the room today. So on behalf of my partners at GSB and our friends and colleagues and investors and portfolio companies and overall kind of supporters of the ecosystem, welcome to our sixth annual GSB Leaders Summit. We've got to Thank you. Thank you. We are going to actually begin with a little audible this morning, and we're going to go straight to a panel. Can higher education innovate its way to the future? I think, oh, here we go. It's working. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see everyone this morning. Um, my name is Dan Summer. I'm co-founder of 10X uh, Impact, which is an investment advisory firm for EdTech Future of Work companies. Prior to that, I was founder and CEO of Trilogy Education. Uh, it's great to be here today. We're here to discuss an extremely important topic, that of innovation in higher education. It's a fascinating topic for me personally because it's something we talked often about at Trilogy with corporations, with universities, with students. It was a real topic of debate for us. And today, we're here with an esteemed and varied uh, panel of experts on this topic. So what I'd like to do uh, is to start with introductions. If everyone, uh, maybe starting with Scott, could go down and, and give us your name, your role, who you're with, and maybe something that we wouldn't be able to read about you in your bio. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good to see many of you. Um, I am uh, currently uh, have been serving as the president of Western Governors University for nearly four years. Uh, in case uh, some of you who don't know me, my cumulative experience in higher education is four years. Um, I came from uh, industry into WGU. Uh, I love what I do at WGU. I love WGU. Um, something that uh, you may not know about me, I think even what probably compelled me to join WG is that I'm incredibly emotional and I, I'm a crier every time I go to our <laughs> commencements. Uh, I am moved by the experience that education has on people's lives. Wonderful. I don't have my tissues with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, good morning, Laura Ibsen. I'm the president and CEO of Elucian, and uh, for the past two years I've been uh, um, in the higher education space. Prior to that, I was a creature of Silicon Valley for 25 years, working at early days at Cisco and Microsoft and Oracle. Uh, something you wouldn't know about me is I, I was thrilled to give my first commencement speech last year at Bryant University and uh, with my mother in the audience who got her PhD when she was 57, uh, who later complained to me that it wasn't fair that I could get a, a doctorate over a weekend. I had an honorary doctorate, so uh, <laughs> she's still quite upset with me, but actually was one of my most proud moments to have my mother in the audience. So. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mitch Gordon, CEO, uh, co-founder of Verto Education. Uh, really good to be here. Um, I spent most of my career in higher education and, uh, and travel, meaningful travel. Um, so it's been really fun to uh, see the growth of Verto and, and, and know a lot of people in this room. And thanks to GSV and everybody here for, for putting this together. Something different about me, I, you inspired me to be a little bit more vulnerable than I think I would have with your emotional talk, so, so thank you. Uh, I'm a meditator. Uh, I believe mindfulness meditation is a really neat tool. Um, so if there are people here who like talking about that over, over drinks later, that's something I, like, I love talking about. And I'm Arthur Levine. And these days, I'm distinguished scholar of higher education at NYU. It turns out titles get better and better the less they pay you. <laughs> and something you all learned by reading my Vita is that I'm fluent in Cantonese. One of the reasons you won't read that is that it's not true. <laughs> very good, very good. We'll be joined as well uh, shortly by uh, John Katzman. He'll be joining the panel as well. I'll let him uh, introduce himself. Uh, innovation in higher education. Uh, much has been said and written on the topic. So I wanted to start uh, by asking all of our panelists, and maybe this time we'll start with Arthur. Uh, why do you think higher education needs innovation? What are some of the challenges that higher education is facing today? 
our society is moving from a national analog industrial economy to a global digital information economy, and higher education was created for the former. And like all of our social institutions, it doesn't work as well as it used to. And it needs to be refitted for a new world. And that's either going to occur by um, repairing what exists or replacing it. You know, I, I, um, if you look across every industry, this whole wave of di digital disruption happened decades ago, you know, with the advent innovation around uh, connectivity and broadband. And I think it's not about innovation and innovation for innovation's sake, but it's about looking and saying, how can we solve the toughest challenges? How can we optimize time? Because it seems to be the one thing that we don't have more of. And, you know, quite frankly, as you look at higher ed, and I have a son, the junior at NYU, uh, they want something different and a different experience, and it has to connect to their future aspirations faster. And I think having to figure out how do we move a traditional model to something more, dis you know, suiting the student is is got to embrace innovation in new ways. And I think it makes us all uncomfortable, but that's the change that we have to get comfortable with being a little bit more uncomfortable. And uh, in, in Mitch, uh, curious from your perspective as an entrepreneur who recently yeah. started. Uh, a, a company to help innovate, uh, to help institutions to innovate. What is your perspective on some of the challenges you were trying to solve? <clears throat> well, uh, I, mean, I think we, seeing everything going on in the country and everything going on in the world, I think it feels more important than ever that we do really need some change. I mean, what, what is ultimately the purpose of higher education is to create critical think, critically thinking, engaged global citizens who care about our democracy, who care about the world, who care about having engaging conversations in meaningful ways. Um, and, that's, that's not happening to the degree that we'd like it to have, have happen, and higher education can be a part of that change. Um, and so that's the way I look at it, um, that, that we start with that goal. Um, and if we start with that goal and look critically at our current institutions and the way that we're um, delivering that kind of education to our students, I think there's a lot that we can do better with that goal. So when I, when I wake up every day, when I think about um, what we're doing, that's the way I think about it. How can we make the deepest possible impact um, on students in higher ed to when they, when they go out into the real world, not just be job ready, that's part of it, but to be societally engaged in really meaningful ways, to have a depth of emotional awareness in the way that they interact with people, with their family members, with their peers. Um, and I think, and I hope, um, that we can do a lot of that differently with some real genuine innovation in our institutions. And Scott. Well, um, i just like to challenge a little bit the notion of uh, what is the purpose and promise of higher education is like, while well, all that is well-meaning and good, I think the reality is, is the value proposition of education is it's the surest path to opportunity. I think, uh, I think my own perspective is the reason it needs innovation is because that promise, it doesn't work and it definitely doesn't work for everyone right now. Um, if I were to look at uh, the reasons that it is going through a period of disruption, uh, there, uh, there are a number of different factors. First and foremost, if you look at the last 50 years, the attainment rates have uh, been decidedly disproportionately favoring the wealthy. If you look at the top 25% of income households, you know, their attainment rates have gone from low 40% to north of 70% in the last 50 years. But if you're in the bottom income quartile of households, it's gone from 9% to 11%. So the model of education we have, it works if you're wealthy. Uh, most of us sitting in this room, our children will go to college, they'll likely finish college, they'll likely be on a path to a great opportunity. That is not true for the vast majority of Americans, and we've got to fix that. The other problem is, is that even those who are going through it, the ROI just isn't working like it used to work. Um, uh, it's pretty evident over the last three decades, the cost of education is, uh, has far outpaced uh, the inflation rate of virtually every other sector in the United States, including healthcare, by the way. And so when the cost of a degree uh, is over $80,000, uh, there are a declining number of opportunities you can attain that that $80,000 investment makes it worth it. Uh, and the last I would say in terms of engaged citizenry is like, I think we should just pay attention to the individuals, the students as consumers of education that, that they are pursuing it to get a job and get a great first job. And I've never known an engaged citizen that was worrying about how to pay their bills every month. And so if I think we could focus on making sure that the ROI or the promise of education actually works, then we'll start innovating in a way that starts reinvigorating that, not just for the wealthy or the privileged, but for everyone. And, and I would agree with that in that sometimes we think about innovation of being, oh, the future of AI and machine learning, but when you look at the basics in terms of enrollment and retention 
and you know the dropout rates being insane, 40 percent overall, 50 percent public sector, we should say, how do we innovate to make it smarter, to make sure that institutions are recruiting the right students, making sure that the ones that really need financial aid are getting it and make the system more productive. That will enable us to free up more time so that these new really cool super innovations across the board and things that we invest in research for every institution can flourish. And I think you know that's the benefit of seeing the online community coming in to sort of fill those gaps, whether it's ASU or or Southern New Hampshire. Or WGU. Is, I'm sorry, WGU. I meant sorry, WGU uh, or Southern, <laughs> start with you first, or Southern New Hampshire, right, educating in, in war zones uh, with refugees. I mean, these are things that, how do you leave an entire society behind when there's trauma around the world and the wonderful things that WGU is doing? So, so I, I always believed that universities would be the center of innovation. Uh, and would be the center of evolution uh, in, in uh, innovation within the higher ed sector. Um, is that going to be the case uh, going forward? Will universities continue to be at the center, hi John, uh, to be at the center of, of higher education? Uh, or will other players uh, emerge and lead the way for innovation? And I'd love to get Arthur's perspective perhaps to start. I think that remains to be seen. I'm doing. Um, a book about the future of American higher education. And one of the things I've done is look back at the transformation that occurred during the Industrial Revolution, which was every bit as big as what's going on now. We had these medieval little colleges that got transformed into major universities. Where did the action happen? The action wasn't in higher education. It was at the periphery of higher education. It was new colleges and universities that got created. In that time, it was a place like MIT that did technology, Cornell that did comprehensive universities, and um, Johns Hopkins that did graduate school. Universities became important only to the extent that they diffused those models and became the centerpiece for spreading this throughout higher education. It depends upon whether higher education accepts that challenge. The other piece I'll add is this. What's going to be asked of higher education in the years to come is probably very different. Right now, 80% of all job loss is occurring because of automation. So what that means is we're going to have a huge population larger than traditional higher education asking for reskilling and upskilling. What they're going to be asking for is not degrees. They're not going to be asking for four-year programs. They're going to be offering, asking for just-in-time education that does whatever it is they need to do. Given the size of that population, the fact they're as interested in such different things, to the extent that higher education embraces that, it can lead to the future. To the extent that it allows other organizations to do that, it won't. John, I'm curious for your opinion, uh, and maybe even to ask, what is the role of the corporation in higher education moving forward? Right, well, first I apologize for being sort of kind of late. Um, but, but I wanted, uh, I'll just yell. Uh, there you go. I guess. Tweak what you're saying, Arthur, that there are real changes coming but the precedent that you gave, I think, leads to the right answer here. It's not that higher ed won't be at the center of things. It's just that there will be new players in higher ed. The notion that the solution is we don't need colleges, we don't need degrees, misses the point. We totally need them. We'll need them more than ever. The ones that win will evolve to the new needs. But I don't think the sector itself will be replaced any more than it was in the industrial era. A new sector developed, but it doesn't matter. I agree with you, which is kind of nice for you and me. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's exciting to see this broader ecosystem playing out. I mean, institutions, I spent many years at Cisco, and we built the Cisco Networking Academies because we, we were filling a gap in education we need to build out the networks. And that grew into massive online global feeder for the workforce. Um, that curricula ultimately got into, in particular, some high schools and community colleges. 
So as you look and say, from the early days of General Motors, building an education institution to now over 4,000 corporations having their own institution or university type approach, I think it's you get the best of both and through the connectivity and you know, phenomenal things that we can do online, we just build out of an ecosystem so that the speed to learning and knowledge and getting that next job and being more fulfilled happens through this new ecosystem. And I think that's where technology has to be um, clear, has to be more productive and affordable. There are certain I presumptions I think that will change the shape. I agree with John, which is the players in post-secondary education will be dramatically different in a generation from now than they are today. Um, and there are certain dynamics I was just thinking about what's going to shape that. And, and one you can contrast pretty easily, which is had the internet existed when the Morrill Act was signed, you would have never had the Morrill Act. Um, because part of that was to try to actually create access and proximal location to education in a way that today the geographic service area of uh, a post-secondary institution, it's kind of disrupted because you can reach and teach individuals where they are, leveraging virtual education delivery in a way that, that you couldn't in prior generations. I think also what we're recognizing is that the, the relevancy of the education, you know, encapsulated entirely in a single unit of measure of bachelor's degree, if you will, that has been declining in terms of its relevancy to the rapidly changing workforce. It's not to say that it's not going to exist, it's just simply saying acquiring that, uh, those individuals who acquire it, they, they have had a decline in readiness for the workforce. And so people are trying to figure out how to augment that. While you're augmenting, you start to realizing that we can actually deliver post-secondary education that is addressing non-consumption, that is addressing you know, workforce development areas in a way that traditional models weren't, such that if your institution built around the traditional model, you better figure out really quickly how you're going to deliver value in the future of it. That includes the kind of unbundling of the credential and how do you make it much more relevant to the future work? How do you make it much more affordable? How do you actually access individuals that, uh, that need uh, access to high quality education, et cetera, in ways that, that your traditional model may have not built around? If you can't change really quickly, you are definitely subject to that disruption. Meanwhile, there are many alternative providers that are entering that we're quite excited about because of the articulation of that learning that can also be transferable into degree-seeking students as well, whether they're coding boot camps, employer-provided training, or otherwise, or workforce and uh, paid, internship, paid internships, you, you name it, that we're actually seeing that disruption occur, that the modes and methods of learning are changing rapidly. Uh, all of that is contributing to the future of post-secondary education. I, again, I just add to that, I think, it, one way that I think about this is, what, what do we know today? Um, and I think one thing that I visited uh, 100 college campuses in 40 states over the last year and a half. It's been really interesting and quite a, quite a country tour for me, but it's really giving me very deep insight into what's actually happening in our institutions around the country. And I think if we're looking for something provocative, I'll say that it's far worse than people actually see in the public sphere. Many people in the room know this, but I think that there, there will be certainly colleges that will close down over the coming years that will surprise people and it will happen more quickly than people think. That's, that's one prediction that I'd make. And so if we, if we feel that way today, well, what replaces that, I think, is the real question. And people on the panel have talked about what that might be. Part of it's certainly going to be institutions that are innovative, that, that, will, do, uh, that will serve workforce um, in a different way, will serve students in a different way. But I think it's definitely going to come from outside universities as well. And I think those are the things when we look back um, five years from now, that there will be some things that we didn't expect that will come from outside the sector that will be truly disruptive. Um, and, and really interesting and beneficial to society and students as a whole. Um, I think we need some more of those ideas, certainly. To, what, what happens to replace some of the institutions that go away? Is it just that the current universities get bigger, or do we actually have some truly unique ideas that come out? And I think that there's still some really unique ideas out there that are going to come out in the next few years that will be you know, transformative to what we think about higher education. So, so Mitch, let, just capitalizing on that point, because we have a lot of people on the panel that provide services to universities or are in a position to maybe influence certain decisions that are being made by universities from a vendor and partner perspective. So you sit down with hundreds of universities across the country. What, what kind of advice, if you put just your advice hat on, and this goes for, for Laura and John and Mitch, what advice would you give to universities, given the shifts that are likely to, to occur over the next 10 to 15 years? If you had you know, time with presidents of universities like Scott, what would you say to them to, to, to help them uh, to be in that headspace of preparation for the future. It's directly to me, Mitch or John or Laura. I mean, 
it, I think it's a really, really hard question. You know, I, I, I don't mean this um, we don't like metaphor to be, <laughs> I mean, I mean this um, metaphor, this analogy to be glib, but I think it is a little bit like asking a bookstore um, in, in the 90s to find a way to, to survive. I think that for some of them, it's just the model doesn't work um, for, some, for some institutions. I think especially small liberal arts schools in rural areas, which by the way is a whole different problem because of some of those best jobs in the country in those areas. And I think we really need to start talking about that too. I mean, that, that's, I, I felt literally emotional pain being in areas and going, this, this school's not going to be here in 10 years. And it's the one real source of quality. So what do we do about that too? That's an interesting um, issue as well. But I think, um, I think, I think I, I'm not really sure. I'd be curious to hear what other people say. I mean, I think for some, there's just inevitably they will close down. I think we're seeing some real innovation in, in degree models. I think we'll see, um, I think we'll, one thing I think that we'll definitely see and we're starting to see already is large name institutions doing things more quickly and fast we never would have expected before. You know, um, large, you know, big name universities doing online degrees, doing them more quickly, doing them in different ways to capture the rest of the market um, in, in ways we wouldn't expect today. So number one, um, the Silicon Valley narrative that we don't need degrees, we're post degrees, uh, there's an explosion of new certificates and credentials and so forth, has very little data behind it. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's true, but even if it were true, it hits issue number two, which is that, a high, that there's data that says that higher ed is less relevant to getting a job or having a career than it used to be. It never was about getting your first job. Um, the data actually from Gallup is that higher ed has and continues to be a tremendous driver of long-term careers. And there's no data that says that that's not true. And most of the people who talk about the disruption caused by AI and robotics say that probably the best education to have an agile career over the next 20, 30, 40 years is a liberal arts education. So the first bit of advice is you better start telling the story better because you're being counterpositioned by people trying to sell things and they're wrong, but they'll put you out of business. Sorry, just to contend with that point a little bit, John. Um, uh, the attribution window, I love the study that came out, Georgetown CW, uh, of the 40 years to have a payoff of a liberal arts degree, first of all. No one in e-commerce, which is the background I have, like that, attribu that attribution window is really, really long. Um, second is like the number of variables that exist around in terms of the long-term trajectory of an individual's career um, and profession and, and advancement and progress, et cetera. It's like there are way too many variables. Yes, I would agree with you that the aggregate data definitely says that the bachelor's degree, it is still the surest path to opportunity. That's why WGU, that was, that's why we believe in it. Having said that, the traditional approach to the one and done model of you need to acquire a 120 credit bachelor's degree to be that path to that first opportunity is like, why can't we break up the notion that the four year degree is the first thing you have to do versus that acquiring of that credential could actually occur over some period of time that it could span six to 10 years. And there's a more economic model by which in fact you can acquire a micro-credential that can be a great path to your first opportunity while you continue to stack learning on top of that such that you build into the credential of a degree because I agree with you, which is the lifetime value of the learning credential because I have critical reasoning, I can deal with ambiguity, I have interpersonal skills, I have analytical horsepower, all those things that employers value, that does not uh, supplant the fact that they also value highly relevant skills and ta you know, task-based competencies that you need as well such that if you acquire a liberal arts degree today, the employability of that is far lower than acquiring the skills-based one. However, that can change very quickly in a six to 10 year time period where you need all those capabilities that are related to liberal education as well. Let's just rethink the model of delivering that because the one and done approach to it, I don't think is gonna work going forward, especially if it takes typically a student more than five years and it's gonna cost more than $80,000. How do you start rethinking that model? And at least we would argue at WG, one way to rethink that is forget the seat time as a measure of learning. Focus on competency-based education. Unbundle the acquisition of the degree rather than doing it all in one chunk. 
how do you stage it over time so an individual can also learn and then earn, learn and earn, and keep going through a lifelong learning loop of model. I think that will exist in the future as, as likely scenarios as anything else. The last thing I would say is that um, there is no data to prove an intuition we have about where the future is going because it doesn't exist yet. And so we're trying to actually innovate for something that you will not actually acquire data for. That's the point of doing randomized controlled trials and everything else, which is you do have to prove those things out rather than looking at the past to try to prove what the future is going to be. I, I, that, this is yeah. Go ahead. What I was going to say is I don't think we can dismiss not knowing about the future. What I'd say is I just did a study of three knowledge industries, newspapers, music, and film, that each faced exactly the same challenges as higher education, demographic, economic, and technological. And the reality was they got blown away, and their industries ended up being disrupted dramatically by technology. Higher education won't be disrupted by the economy, and it won't be disrupted by demographics. They'll change things, but the basic model will still persist. The mistakes those three industries made were, number one, they projected tomorrow on the basis of yesterday. Two, they didn't keep up with their competitors. Three, they ignored what consumers were asking for. And four, they didn't engage in innovation. When they did engage in innovation, they tried to slip it into the current model. For all of those reasons, and the reality is that for-profits change more quickly than not-for-profits. Not-for-profits change by repair, which is slow. For-profits change by replacement, which involves as soon as an industry becomes unprofitable or out of date, it gets replaced. And that's what happened. If we look at those, we can see what's likely to happen to us. I'd just like to disconnect the tax, stat tax exempt status from innovation. We are a nonprofit university, so uh, um, I, don't, I, I personally think that the tax status of an institution has little to do with its ability to innovate. Okay, so uh, we're, we're through our kind of formal questions, and we'd like to open it up uh, to Q&A uh, from the audience. But I'd like to start by introducing our house whips. Uh, so we've got Kristen and Sarah. And could you start quickly by just a quick introduction of yourself? And our, our house whips, whips in, the, in the role is to make sure we're, we're asking great evocative questions. Uh, and they will uh, facilitate that process in the audience. Yeah, hi. So I'm Kristen Eshelman. I'm director of innovation initiatives at Davidson College. I'm one of those small private liberal arts colleges that everyone's worried about. Um, <laughs> but we would, we would argue that, um, and our president does this very eloquently, that the skills gap question is really less about skills. I mean, you were talking about rapid change and uncertain futures. Um, it's really more about traits and these kinds of traits that are going to keep you employable for the long term, which is something we do really well, but we don't know how to package and scale that yet. That's something we're working on. I would love to hear from the panel or others about ideas for scaling those kinds of traits. What does that look like? I don't think it's competency and I don't think it's skills. Um, hi, I am Sarah Bowder. I have a great title. It's called the Chief Transformation Officer. Um, I am at the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. I came with Dan Greenstein from the Gates Foundation. And we are trying to take 14 institutions together as a system and pivot them very quickly because they're going off the financial cliff. Great. Okay. So, so at this point, I think we'd like to open up questions uh, from the audience to the panelists. Can you ask them to say, who are you and what do you do when you ask your question? Hi, I'm, I'm Jeff Livingston. I'm a recovering educational publisher. <laughs> I, I wonder about the, um, the higher ed industry, if they're concerned about being disrupted by politics. Seems to me we're all experiencing a rejection of elites around the Western world. Only a third of American adults have a four-year degree. How do we keep the other two-thirds paying for them? And are, are universities actually thinking about that? Because a political disruption could happen very, very quickly if 
large numbers of vote voters in, dem in democratic societies stop believing that the, uni the expensive universities are for them and therefore start supporting candidates who stop supporting those universities. Have you guys thought about that? Are there conversations among higher ed leaders about that? Uh, I, I'll take an attempt to answer your question. Um, I think this is one of the, what you raise is definitely one of the considerations around what we, I would generally refer to as reinvigorating the promise of education for everyone. Because uh, what you highlight, I think, is generally true, which is taxpayer-funded access to a capacity-constrained industry is definitely a, a, a recipe for continuing to increase access among the privileged and not really expanding access to everyone. The other challenge, I think, with some of the notions that are proposed today around whether it's free or heavily uh, tax-subsidized uh, models of it is that that doesn't fix the underlying challenges with the product itself, which is, is it increasing its quality and relevancy and readying the individuals for the future of work? Uh, is it delivering on the value proposition that it is the sure path opportunity, et cetera? In all that context, my, my general sense is, um, is that if you focus on the student, or if you focus on the purpose that your institution delivers on, the politics will be what they will be. Um, I think we can endeavor to influence them and shape them, et cetera. But, but that, by that, what I mean is fundamentally this, is that if you start changing the perspective of an institution to primarily serve students as consumers of post-secondary education, you start focusing on delivering innovation and value that, that ensures that, that that education that they're going to acquire is going to lead to opportunity, that they're going to be able to acquire it at a lower cost, that they're going to have a greater probability of actually acquiring a job and an outcome and et cetera that makes it affordable, meaning it's uh, that you focus on that, uh, that model of that, that it increases the personalization, personalization of it, it increases the probability that every type of learner can succeed, meaning that you're adapting to the individual rather than we have a standard model, if you do well, you get A's and you graduate, et cetera, versus, uh, versus dropping out. If you focus on that, you'll start creating models that legislation and policy didn't contemplate. I'm speaking from experience on that because I think no institution has faced an OIG recommendation larger than WG has ever faced. Um, but we had one thing to stand on, which is we deliver outcomes for the students, that when those outcomes work, that even policy and legislation will catch up to saying, let's, how do we support those things that are increasing the quality and relevancy of education, they're expanding access at a more affordable model. They're delivering outcomes that lead to great jobs for the lives of the individuals who pursue it. Um, when those things work, I think policy and legislation will catch up. And so that's why I'd say focus on the student first and the value propositions that tend to deliver and let legislation and policy catch up. In my sense is focus on people. I think that the gap between policymakers and practitioners is as large as I've seen it in the course of my career. They speak different languages, they distrust each other, and they have different agendas. I spoke to the head of the Senate committee in one state uh, in higher education, and he told me, you can introduce legislation to deny humanities majors financial aid. One of the critical ingredients is bringing those people together to talk to each other for extended periods of time. It's the only thing that's going to work in different states. We've begun doing that at Woodrow Wilson with uh, bringing policymakers and practitioners together for a year. By the end, they were working on joint programs. These are people. These are not just ideas. One quick story from my perspective. Uh, people often say to me, Mitch, how can you run an $8,000 quality in-person semester? And my response to that is always, why isn't everybody doing that? We've bundled, we've, we've come to a point where we've accepted that higher ed should be so expensive uh, because we've bundled so many things into it. We've bundled sports into it and research into it and you know, um, gardens and museums and all these other things and we make our 18 to 22 year olds pay for it. Uh, we just focus on three main things which is delivering the highest possible quality education with the best possible outcomes and a great place to live and good food along the way. Like, that is actually achievable, and I think when we start unbundling some things along the way, that and, and focusing on the students, 
like everyone said, that, that that is actually possible and that will happen. And so the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, it's, it's really interesting seeing the political um, foray that there's education should be free, we should pay off everyone's tuition. I think we do have to go back to the basics of the economics and uh, for my company, we serve three quarters of all the community colleges in the country, 2,700 institutions globally. We run the student information systems and we have to say if you look at the PASHI system as an example, they need to do more with less and new things too. We have to figure out how to develop system capabilities so that they can see the data around student success holistically, not in little buckets. And that's one of the biggest transformations that, that, that we are listening to our customers to support and to move this forward, whether it's all the California community colleges being on one platform, so there's one identity per student, and dramatically reducing the cost of running these systems, doing regulatory reporting. So I think there's a consolidation around the infrastructure that will create more choice for online and on campus. It's really important because as I go, I haven't been to as many campuses as you have yet, but as you go out there and, and bring in the politicians, that small college that may serve under 1,000 students, even 500, is the lifeblood of their community. So there's an economic impact. And when I talk to my customers, not all of them can have a world-class CIO. Most of them don't have a CISO, a security officer. So developing these platforms have more visibility for mobility of students to be on campus, online. And then we see these new models where, where online providers are building in um, opportunities for students who didn't complete their degree to do it in a more economical way. And for me, I, I just believe that brings choice. And those are the conversations that we have to have. The core economics need to change. And I feel great responsibility to be part of that, to um, make sure that we take the load off our customers so that they can use resources to do new things. The Connecticut um, state system built a whole platform, moved to cloud. And guess what? One of the things they could do is help bring more advisors to have the human touch, the one-to-one. -one. While we can nudge students all day long and do everything online, which is fantastic, sometimes they, they need to be face-to-face. -face. And so many of these institutions, it's like one to a thousand. And th that's where you think about moving from student success to student well-being. You build a platform. You create this wonderful world where you can actually use the insights for data for action and look at st student well-being beyond what, what course and what finances they have, but how are they functioning in the community of their education? How can you make sure they stay on path? So this is the future where I think platforms will come together and we've got to move in this direction or else I think we will see many of these small colleges not be able to afford crumbling infrastructure. They've got to get on a platform so that they can operate in new ways and learn from each other. And that's some of the work that you see, great things that Sarah's doing in the PASHI system, what we're working on in California, Dr. Johnson in the SUNY system, uh, most diversified system in the country, 470,000 students. They don't know what's happening across all the campuses, but we can do that if we really find new ways to use data um, across the board and make it more future forward, future proof. That's when I listen to my customers, that's what they're asking for. John, I think you had a comment. One of the things we have to think about is why technology has had so little impact on K-12. And what, what did we do wrong, right? And a lot of it is that tech people have a really analytic mindset. We break things down. We unbundle them, decouple them, and lose all the context. And I would argue that we're in danger of doing much the same thing in higher ed. That we don't know exactly why higher ed has had such impact on people's lives um, and, on, and on the communities around these schools. And so we pull everything apart and we say, no, 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 it really, we don't need all that touchy-feely stuff. We just need uh, uh, you know, certain skills that are really important and we need to upskill and reskill and, and maybe, but it's very possible that we're missing the point. And, and the, the question, the patience required to test things longitudinally and to think about synthetic reasoning, putting things back together into a coherent ecosystem, I think is lost in a lot of places. I, I am always a skeptic of Minerva in certain kinds of ways, but the fact is it is the most perfect synthetically constructed entity, um, and it'll succeed or fail, and I'm 
confident it will succeed. Uh, based on is this overall solution working versus little pieces where we pull them out and just see what happens. What happens if you don't really need seat time if we just do you know, testing-based uh, advancement uh, uh, and diplomas? Maybe that'll work. How much money are we going to put behind it? How much effort are we going to put behind it be before we find out? Other questions? Hello, hi, Maria Spees from Holland IQ, a global market intelligence firm in education. One of the things that just fits right into what you've just been talking about is, at some point in the past, it seems that universities were the only credible alternative to post-secondary education. Everyone aspired to that. And underlying that assumption um, was the assumption that universities were the only ones who could really teach all these critical thinking skills and so on, and everyone else did sort of upskilling type things. And I wonder if we can think more about broadly the post-secondary sector. There's polytechnics, community colleges, universities, different types of models. There's going to be a reshaping of this whole space, but still we think about higher education as only universities and only universities being able to be the gold standard for all those soft skills, if you like, that ultimately will lead to a long-term great future for people. I would argue that that's not the case, that what if other, um, whether it be at, at a polytechnic or other types of technical education, can also deliver amazing soft skills and, and critical thinking and so on? Is, is that the real threat to universities? No, I guess I'd argue that post-secondary education, which has been with us since the first American colleges, has always filled in the gaps. What they've done is they've recognized the shortcomings in curriculum. So when universities didn't do science, didn't do modern language, they did. They recognized shortages or mistakes in terms of access and took those populations. And they still continue to do that. And what's happened is universities have always looked down at them saying, the reason we don't do those things, they don't deserve to be done until they proved they were necessary and could be done then they adopted them. So there have been two sectors that have always been in conflict. We absolutely need the post-secondary sector, which has served as a laboratory and frequently has provided the future for us when higher education didn't. Well, we are just out of time right now with our panel, so a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Great conversation.